Being a watch dealer these days requires learning an entirely new language. With me today, I brought royalty in the watch dealing industry, Mr. Roman Scharf himself, that is aware of some of these key terms that we're gonna discuss and try to teach you. This is gonna be our version of Duolingo Watch Dealer Edition. Welcome, Roman, how are you? Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Avi. Royalty, really. That's yes. not one of the lingo terms, I hope. Royalty. No, it's not. We have <laughs> similar ones, but not royalty itself. You know what? I should have called you the unicorn. Oh, yeah, because thanks. Because unicorn is a watch term. Roman, let's talk about some of the key terms that you need to know in order to be a watch dealer. It's not as simple as, here, I have this watch. It is in good condition, I think. Uh, it's new. Um, here's how much I want for it. Here's what you're going to pay me for, right? It's not that easy. It is absolutely not that easy, but it's not more about having to know that it's, I think it, it stems from this fact that when you're talking to somebody in the watch industry, you can right away tell a rookie from a veteran, you can right away tell from somebody that knows what they're talking about versus somebody who's just sort of like floating by. Uh, it happens rather quickly for young dealers, they do pick up on the lingo, but it's something that distinguishes, let's say a rookie from a vet, and it's really not that complex. It's not. I mean. Some of this is easy to understand. The acronyms themselves are not easy because you would never figure, you know, putting these words together. But once you understand what the acronym means, it's, you know, yeah, pretty because simple. Again, you also have to keep in mind that if before a lot of communication uh, took place over the phone, face to face, the industry has changed. Now you have a ton of yep. chats and Facebook groups and things of that nature. A lot of the stuff has gone digital. So even to some veterans like me, some of these acronyms, I'm like, wait a minute, what is that? Like, and then why? <laughs> do you think a lot of the, a lot of it has to do with like younger people entering the industry and using like instead of talk to you later, TTYL, instead of, uh, you know, just introducing my favorite, my favorite one is T to the fourth power Y. What is that? Time to talk to you. Time to talk to you. <laughs> T to the fourth power Y. I get heard it. that one. I feel like it just, you know, again, OK turned into just K. Which so, I hate. Yeah, it's the worst. If you can type K, K or KK, you can type OK. I hate 100%. it. 100%. I want to get started with probably one of the more recognizable ones. Now, we have a very long list, so I'm going to try to rush through them. Um, one of the most, most recognizable ones is one that people constantly hear in our videos, and that is Mazal. So what it stems from is the fact that a humongous part of our industry is Jewish, right? Uh, specifically the diamond industry, uh, a lot of the watch industry. And uh, when you have a majority uh, of people in the industry of one religion, one race, whatever it might be, it doesn't really matter. You tend to use words that are used at home. Mm -hmm. And mazal simply means deal, done deal, right? Uh, it's a Yiddish word, right? Uh, based on German, obviously, that came over from Ashkenazi, part of the, uh, the Jewish race, if you will, right? Those that were in Europe versus the Sephardic, which is the ones you'll find in the Middle East and things of that nature. Basically, uh, the European Jews are the lighter skinned ones and the, the Sephardic Jews are the, are the darker skinned ones, right? Except for me. Uh, except for you. I don't know how the hell you turned out. But uh, uh, ma the word mazal has always been used for ages in any industry, uh, specifically those the Jews were a part of. But that's something that caught on fast. And uh, yeah. it, it's, it is not strange when you have a... Uh, uh, I'm at the Hong Kong show and an Asian person comes over to me who speaks four words of English, but one of those words is actually mazal. He has no idea what it even means. I was just going to ask you about that. How does it feel like when you see somebody that has no idea where, this, where it stems from, what the history of the word is using that word? It, it's, it's perfectly fine because it's, be, it's become part of your everyday lingo, right? It's like saying that, uh, you know, instead of saying I'm going to copy someone or Xerox something, right? If you're Xeroxing something, it sounds absolutely normal to you. You know you're using it for the word of copy. It's lost its origin. It's lost its origin, its meaning. It's just simply in our industry, meaning, hey, we have a deal. But it goes a little bit deeper yes. in the sense that, you know, if you mazal somebody on something and then you break your mazal, this is when shit yeah. hits the fan. Oh, my God, he broke mazal. Yeah. Right? It carries way more weight. It, than it, it carries deal. a lot more yeah. weight. But it's basically a way of shaking hands and say we have a deal. Okay. So let's, let's kind of try to run through these. Next one is relatively simple. It's mint. What does it mean when somebody tells you to watch his mint? Again, it depends on who you talk to, right? A mint watch is something that's like new that may have a blemish or two somewhere, maybe a hairline scratch somewhere. But a watch, when a watch is described as mint, it's as close as new as possible. In fact, it could be a pre-owned watch that will that will be pretty much new. 
which is in line with another term that's commonly used, which is retail ready. Retail ready is a bit different. Retail ready is something that when I get a watch that's retail ready, my expectation is for not to have to take out that tiny little scratch or take out a little hairline scratch. So that's the difference between mint and retail exactly. ready. Exactly. Mint can still have, it, it's sort of a nine out of 10, where retail ready is something that I can take out of the box, ship it to my client without having to worry about testing the watch, for timing, for water mm-hmm. tests, well, all the tests that we do here on any watch, really. Uh, whereas mint watches, it just refers to the condition, where retail ready refers to the condition, cosmetic condition, as well as mechanical condition, meaning that you. for me, retail ready, if I send somebody a retail ready watch, that means I can send it directly to their customers and they don't have to worry about it. You gotcha. Dog. The dog is a watch that won't sell, right? <laughs> Anything that doesn't sell and doesn't sell well, i.e. an unpopular model. And you often hear me refer to older models like, oh, this used to be a dog, and now, because it was a dog, they didn't make many of them, and I became a collectible, right? Which is kind of strange, right? A dog that's now a collectible and highly desirable. But in a nutshell, it's a simple down, a dog is just a watch that's a very difficult sell. Something could have been a dog, and it's no longer a dog. Exactly. Oh, that changes. You can go from a dog to a cat. That yeah. that's, not a, that's not a terminology, by the way. <laughs> Uh, a dog could have turned into a sleeper. No, a sleeper, a dog could have been a sleeper at the same time. Could have been time. a sleeper at yeah. the same time as being so a dog. So a dog, a, a, dog a, a watch that is a sleeper, and you heard me refer to this numerous times in multitude of my videos, what I do in unboxing on, on uh, Instagram or if I'm doing a YouTube thing, I always talk about sleepers. Sleepers are those watches that have unrecognized value. This is something that based, again, on one's experience, and in case we're talking about me, in my experience, I've always managed over the years to identify those sleepers. And the way I identify them is based on a sales history, its current pre- its current models, its younger, uh, I guess, family that's currently selling well, that I know is gonna bring up the older ones, production numbers, uh, rare dials, uh, rare combination, limited editions, things that were not, are not necessarily popular, they're sort of staying, they're not dogs, they're just above dogs, right? So they're sort of that middle key that just steadily selling, not as popular as everything else, not flying off the shelves, but has the potential to become an Uber collectible and shoot in price quickly. Which then can turn into a heavy hitter? No, a heavy hitter is something a little bit different. Heavy hitter is something that we, return, we refer to usually price-wise, right? Price and complication. Heavy hitter is in t- it's nothing to do with weight or size. Most people would imagine a big, yeah. bulky AP Turbion or Concept, right? Uh, where... A heavy hitter is price. It's money. It's that million dollar Patek Philippe minute repeater. A heavy hitter is a super uber complicated watch, whether it's a Turbion, a minute repeater, a perpetual calendar. A heavy hitter is a combination of expensive as well as complicated. Not always. Sometimes a heavy hitter can just be a diamond encrusted watch, a factory diamond encrusted watch. Could also be a heavy hitter. Let's go into some of the acronyms now. I will pronounce the entire, you know, all the words in there because. These really are wacky. WTB, a.k.a. want to buy. Ian, throw up a a post we have with a picture of an example of that. Um, I'm assuming it's self-explanatory. It is. Is there anything like hidden there? Any any acronyms? Any acronyms? uh, Some will have some hidden, uh, hidden things in there. And it's really about the effect that you're going to have based on an acronym. So want to buy is self-explanatory. I want to buy this watch. In a case of somebody putting up something on a chat, I want to buy this Rolex. I usually will pay more attention to a want to buy because this is a person who's ready to buy. I quote him a price. If it works, he'll probably sell. Which goes in line with uh, sold order. Sold order is even stronger. It's really the same thing as want to buy, right? But when somebody sees a sold order, somebody says, okay, he has the watch sold. That means not only is it 100% sold, but it's also if the price works, it's an immediate sell. So it adds a sense of urgency, but in reality, it's the same shit. Yeah. Uh, need to quote. Need to quote is, I got a client looking for a watch. So they're just asking for your experience to provide a price. No, they're, they're actually no. They're, they're asking if you have the watch in stock okay. and what will it cost me. So usually a need to quote is, oh, you have this Rolex yet? How much? It's $10. Great. Call my client. Watch is available. It's not with me. If you're a proper dealer, most dealers won't say that. I would usually say, I don't physically have the watch in stock. I can source it at this price. It mm-hmm. is available today at $11. Okay. Uh, is there a difference between want to buy and need to buy? NTB versus WTB? That's just dumb. <laughs> it's still the same thing. And it's honestly, just a variation. It's just a variation. You know what I mean? That's all it is. So another self-explanatory one is for sale. <laughs> this F- watch FS? is for sale. For FS, yes. I, 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 to me, FS is it's like... It's, 
has the same effect as KK or just K. Honestly, it's like post the watch. How about just yeah. post the watch on a price? Yeah. Then we go into FSOT, which is for sale or trade, which means that uh, usually it happens in the cases where you have a particular watch that either you're overpriced and you need to take a hit on it, or you know it's really not priced well and you want to make up for it in maybe a maybe a lucrative trade. So that's usually you know when you see FSOT. Usually the market, the price of the actual item is negotiable. Is not as good. Okay. Um, we go into WTT, which is want to trade. Again, about the same effect as KK for yeah. me. This is, this is. ISO in search of. ISO is a common term, not just in our industry. So that one is really, it's a, it's really a good one. Again, remember we're talking about digital here, digital communication here. If I'm on a chat that has 500 dealers, and I have. 10 pieces of inventory. I can take one of my sales guys and say, hey, go and see who's looking for these 10 watches and quote them. All they gotta do yeah. is go into the chat and search for ISO, WTB, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Uh, then we have FTO, FSO, uh, FTO for trade only, FSO for sale only. These are just strict guidelines of what this transaction can be. You know be. what this is? Hmm. This is younger generation flexing on these chats because if you ask most of the guys of my generation they go into these chats and like hey, so why don't you just say what you want like it's 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 ridiculous <laughs> yeah. and it's the same thing as every young kid throwing out there said i need a rolex 116 why don't you say i need a rolex yeah. daytona steel right it's it's a difference in times and that's really different people always ask me like roman oh it's so impressive to me when i talk to somebody and they tell me all these reference numbers i was like you want to be honest you want me to be honest i've been in the industry for 20 years i never bothered remembering reference numbers i do remember a lot of them because yeah. i, I just handle by them. happenstance but I mean, if i'm communicating yeah. with you you will never hear me say rolex 116 something or other you if i'm a client that does not describe anything to me exactly you know? and this is, I actually told some of the kids here, I said, I don't think I want you to do that. If you're talking about a Rolex Daytona, I want you to say, hey, this is a stainless steel Rolex Daytona with a black yeah. dial. This is what I want you to say. Because then you're actually picturing it. You can't picture a reference number. Exactly. And okay. nine out of 10 retail clients, but the problem is, is the retail public catches on too. Yeah. So now you have retail clients out there spitting out, I want the LN or I want the BRLO yeah. and so on and so forth. Uh, let's get into some trading terms, uh, soft call. Soft call meaning that, hey, listen, I got a client that's potentially interested in an item, right? If it's not a strong call, meaning he's not really ready to buy, he may buy in a month, or he may go another route, or he may be choosing between five watches. So you're just fishing for information. Hey, I have this watch, this is what it's gonna cost you. Give you a little bit of data to work with, because if I'm on the phone with a client, he's choosing between five watches, and I don't have any one of them, and again, a lot of the dealers in the industry today are you know, sourcing watches. Mm -hmm. I'm not calling them flippers, notice, I'm, you know, because flippers tends to be a derogatory term. I don't know if that's on your list or not, but uh, I guess we can talk about that too. I'm not calling them, I'm calling them people that source watches. Nothing wrong with that, right? Not everybody can have a gajillion dollar inventory. And honestly, sometimes I envy those guys. But if I'm out there and I'm talking to a client about five different watches and I don't have the, day, the current data up to date and I need to be able to say, well, he may say yes to one of the five, I need to have pricing information so I can provide that at least. Which goes in line with medium call, hard call, and then what we talked about. Again, me, uh, soft call, medium uh, call, and hard medium call and hard call is unnecessary. I mean, yeah. to me, hard call sounds like booty call. But <laughs> what I'm trying to explain to you is that that's unnecessary. If you have a call on something, that means I want to buy, right? Or strong call is the only one yeah. that I go with because now I have a client that's really interested on this one particular watch and odds are is there's a really good chance 75% above that he's going to buy it that to me is a strong call it should be soft and strong and choosing which you know I guess which term to use here is on the dealers you know side like it's their responsibility to make sure that they are not the problem is, is they're not misrep misrepresenting I think I think the the issue here is you know people get used in their own ways of using certain acronyms or mm -hmm. using certain terminology, and the bottom line is, I don't th I think it's lost its meaning because of sheer volume of yeah. the day to day chats out there. People put in this, so people don't even pay attention to those acronyms. I do because I understand the meaning behind because I, I remember how it all originated, right? Because that all came from actual conversation, dealer to dealer talking, saying, hey, what I need and how mm -hmm. strong do I need or how bad do I need it, right? Or what's, what's the actual situation with the client? So some payment terms, um, now again, this is a pretty simple one. 
and, and again, I'm, we're going over these because these are terms that might be showing up in Facebook groups and forums. They are. On Instagram. They are. They are. They, and we they, want people they, to be. They yeah. all leaked over to the retail market. Yeah, we want people to understand what they're looking at instead of, because people feel kind of lost and they feel stupid asking what this means. Exactly. Uh, PP is PayPal. I ask, I ask my uh, you know, 14 year old daughter all the time what somebody's acronyms right. mean, so I don't feel stupid. <laughs> I just had like a conversation with my nephew where I couldn't figure out what he was saying and I was trying to like. You know, and that was English. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, PP, PayPal, that's a payment method, you know, so pay, PP is ex accepted. Um, then we go into a little bit deeper, which is PP, F and F, which is PayPal, friends and family. Okay, so uh, PayPal carries fees, just like a credit card, mm -hmm. right? So you send somebody something via PayPal, PayPal will charge you 3%. Uh, a lot of these watch flippers, especially on some of these groups that are literally called watch flippers, right? Uh, a lot of these flippers, they work on a small margin, 2 to 5% three to 5%, especially when it comes to Rolex. If you're gonna PayPal me for a Rolex I'm making 5% on, I don't wanna give that 3% to uh, PayPal. So friends and family is a loophole. Mm -hmm. Because when you send money friends and family via PayPal, it's it okay. doesn't charge you any fees, but it's all fun and games until you get caught by snagged by PayPal, get banned and you're done. But friends and family also carries the risk of not being able to you know, request that money back. Of course, and, that, and the next thing is, is that friends and family is if you get screwed, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, which is the difference between friends and family and goods and services. Exactly. PayPal goods and, fr and services, everybody pays the fee, everybody's safe. You, PayPal will guarantee you yeah. and, and you know you can dispute the charges. Friends and family, you can't. Uh, some shipping terms, your label. That's simple. It's it's like usually people say, hey, listen, uh, $10,000 for this watch plus your label or your stamp, they'll say. Or plus ship. Or plus uh, stamp. Or plus uh, plus stamp, plus boat emoji. I've, uh, I've, airplane emoji. Yeah, I've, I, um, I actually, um, what do you call it? Um, sent a guy a stamp one time in a package. <laughs> yeah, just, 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 just to mess with him. So we have your label, my label, you have price plus ship, price plus stamp. Then we have net to you, which is a, you know, I guess a financial term. Well, net to you is very simple. This is what, this is the final price that it all come out to everything included. This is how much you will net yeah. you know, or how much I will net or yeah. whatever. Uh, another shipping term that I actually found that was kind of funny is I never knew what this meant. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, finally, CONUS, C-O-N-U-S. Continental, you, continental U.S., seriously? I've never put, like, I didn't know it was that's a shipping a, term. That's, that's a shipping term, like, everywhere. I didn't, you know, I'm like, what the hell is this? Is this like POTUS? Like, what <laughs> no, it's continental United States. <laughs> okay. Um, so obviously if somebody puts CONUS, then shipped free or shipped within the continental United States. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's go into some conditions or just watch descriptions. We have naked. Naked meaning this is only watch, meaning watch no box, only. no papers. I got you. Uh, complete or full kit? Complete full kit, that means the watch should come with everything it comes with as in the factory, i.e. box, papers. And again, it's a, it gets to be a hairy area. Yeah. And uh, when people tell me complete, I always make sure I ask them. Yeah. For example, uh, you know, a lot of dealers out there, especially the newer ones, they don't even know what all the watch is supposed to come with. And there are some clients out there that are uber anal. Like, for example, when it comes to Rolex, Rolex comes with a little white tag yeah. that half the people don't care about and we throw away. Had a we had a client that, that yeah. complained about that. Then there's the green tag. Then there's specific amount of booklets, certain booklets. Uh, you know, then there's, when it comes to modern stuff, it's pretty easy. When you go backwards and you get somebody that's super anal, they want, you know, a, a complete, complete, complete set. They will, you know, they buy a Rolex from 1989. They want the calendar, the Rolex yeah. calendar. They want the handkerchief. Like, but you have to have the knowledge there. So oftentimes, you know, when people say complete, it's a term that's unfortunately used loosely, which is why I buy in a particular watch. Like, if I'm buying a limited edition and I know which box it comes with and what kind of, what the certificate is supposed to look like, what does the extra strap look like? Is there a screwdriver in there, like mm -hmm. Panerai's, for example, right? That's really important on certain watches. So when people tell me complete i take that with a grain of salt and I always double check slider slider is something that will pass for, as a new watch a slider is usually something that's technically a new watch never been worn never been owned right uh let's say it's set around the shop somewhere you know it's been it's been handled it's been tried on there's maybe a few scuffs on it slider is something that if i showed it to you and i told you that it's new you would think it's new gotcha. and then it leaves it up to the dealer's integrity to say hey this is actually a slider i.e like new do you think if you if somebody is referring to a watch as a slider, would you automatically assume that it's also full kit or complete? Uh, not necessarily. And usually when it's uh, usually it's uh, the, you would say slider full set or slider naked. Mm -hmm. Slider also doesn't necessarily mean that it's a watch that's never been owned. A slider can be a pre-owned watch. 
but like I have some clients that have I've sold them watches two three years ago and then they send them back in trade and the watch still looks new mm -hmm. because of the way they wear those watches how often or just just maybe a careful person yeah. overall I know I know a buddy that will not allow his wife walk to the left of him because God forbid she'll bump into his watch like it's, some people get really anal with wow. this stuff and the watch comes back really new that becomes a slider got you uh, meaning yeah. it can slide as new as new okay yeah. i guess that's where it comes from slider comes in yeah, yeah. makes sense slide into her dms yeah, box <laughs> box and papers well, that's that that's just it box and papers but again use but that. again it's not complete again it's box and papers usually identifies as a complete watch a okay. watch comes with box and papers right when we talk about complete we're generally referred to box and papers 99 out of 100 people won't care if there's a little plastic insert missing or or, or a little mm -hmm. tag that's missing especially on the modern end of things because they're really irrelevant like the throwaway things right kind of like candy wrappers but again Take it with a grain of salt as a dealer or as an individual to find out, okay, it has box and paper. Some watches come, there's an inner and outer box. Mm -hmm. Somebody send you one without an outer box because it happened to have ripped in half and they all do. Is that really box and papers? Well, in my mind, yes. And some might, it's, it's really, a lot of these things are very, very loose terms and not exact. Makes sense. New in box. Again, same thing, bo brand new watch, box and papers. Okay. Uh, like new in box, is it? A slider. A slider with a box? It's a it's slider of box okay. and papers. This is a common one that we hear often, and I think it can get tricky. Uh, NOS, new old stock. Okay, so new old stock is a watch that's not current production or something that, let's say, you can have a Rolex that's dated five years ago. It's like, oh, it's new. NOS means that somebody bought that watch, brand new, box papers. Again, it's it can be NOS naked. It can be NOS mm -hmm. box papers or complete. But NOS is something that's truly, truly new, never been worn. That means somebody picked the watch up, put it in the back of the safe, they kept it there for years. I have watches as old as 19, late 50s that came to me, NOS. Wow. And they were truly NOS. And oddly enough, a lot of these NOS watches may have handling marks, some hairline scratches from mm -hmm. moving the watch in and out of the box and so on and so forth. So it doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, this watch is super perfect, right? That you may have a couple of hairlines, in it, but it's still NOS. NOS usually refers to that it's new old stock, meaning that it's a brand new watch, it has never been worn. Okay. Um, a beater watch. A beater watch is something that usually refers to lower priced items, something that you can beat around every day. The problem with that is, you know, to a Kevin Hart, a beater watch may be $100,000. Okay. To someone else, it may be a, you know, the Swatch watch, right? It's a beater watch, sort of like that daily watch that you can beat up. You're not really concerned about it. Uh, a lot of times beater watches will be naked because they're cheaper because they're naked. But again, it's something that sort of that minimum threshold that you can afford for a decent watch that you can just beat around and not really worry about. Which is different from a daily how? Uh, well, because a beater watch is not necessarily a daily. A beater watch could be something that you may only want to wear when you're traveling in places where you deem in, like London, where it may not be so safe to put on your Richard Meal, right? So you can have a beater that if somebody steals it from you, you don't really care, right? Where your daily watch is a watch that you actually wear daily. It's, you know, what do you wear on a daily basis, right? Not everybody has the luxury of us to walk into a vault and change our watches three times a day. So people will have special occasion watches. They'll have the daily watches. You work in corporate environment. And let's say you're someone that, you know, makes an X amount of salary in a department of 100 people that are in line with you, but you happen to have family money or investment mm -hmm. on the side, you're not going to come in rocking a $1 million richer meal yeah. or a big gold Rolex. You probably take like an Omega Speedmaster, you know, depends on the situation. Something you would actually wear daily. Gotcha. Um, this is a term that is common on Facebook. I guess it's common in a lot of social media platforms. But I, I know certain people that have seen this and had no idea what it means, and I actually had to explain to one guy what it meant. When people comment the word bump on a watch post. You know. <laughs> so what happens is, is when, depending on the platform, be it Facebook, be it WhatsApp, uh, a lot of times on WhatsApp you see this, right? Uh, imagine you're in a group where there's a thousand people, right? Which is WhatsApp, for example, right? And you just posted a watch and then a hundred more people posted the same watch. Your watch didn't really get enough attention as you felt. So rather than retyping or reposting the whole thing over and over, just go in the post, click reply, put the word bump, and people will be able to See go to your original post. So on Facebook, you're also dealing with algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. It's not you're not it's not fully controlled. Correct. And uh, what happens there is that it's really just a way of bringing your post to light on whatever platform you might be in. Gotcha. Um, a grail watch, you know, we we know what it means. What does it mean to you? Well, this is a different this is a different conversation altogether. A grail watch is something that would be the it that's just, but it. it's subjective to each individual. Uh, you know the easiest 
way to compare grail watch is is this is the girls on my dreams this is the one my wife right your wife right and there isn't like a one you know a be all end all grail watch well has here's what happens is that grail watch uh, a grail watch can often change which is not an issue it's a problem in marriage when yeah. your grail wife <laughs> <laughs> changes that's a big issue it's expensive and it's just yeah. not a good look luckily for me how long have you been married now 10 years yeah 20 for me Jeez. so uh, yeah i know we're getting old we're getting old so long story short a grail watch is something that's that one watch that i really 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 want oftentimes those watches are unreachable financially like yeah. people will you know oh my grail watch is this six million dollar paddock you know and they're not in the position oftentimes a watch a grail watch will be something that is not reachable in your current financial state yeah. it may be hopefully reachable in the future but it's usually what it comes down to so going over some just very simple terms of i guess describing a watch ss stainless steel rg rose gold yg yellow gold wg white gold um it gets better because a lot of people will then take the reference numbers for example uh you know uh automar piguet identifies rose gold as or right Brig why couldn't they just do it rg well remember different language right ah uh you okay. Brigade will do br right uh ba for uh yellow gold is for ap so oftentimes you'll get a mix of that and that's when it really gets confusing yeah. which is why i say people hey i got a yellow gold royal oak Symbol. makes a lot more sense it's just it's just people what are, what are acronyms all together right it was meant to save people time when they're communicating yeah. right now you go back to the flip phones when you were texting that could be useful nowadays you, you have to just, press each button three you, times you, to get the letter yeah, you can <laughs> just you could just type it out you know you could just say it well you could just say it now you know, voice note <laughs> um mop mother of pearl dial you know that's pretty self-explanatory common common usage mop has been around for such a long time yeah, and because so it, it dealt with jewelry as exactly. well exactly nobody's going to write out mother of pearl dial and if you're in the business you don't know what mop yeah. is you shouldn't be in the business loom loom is just that because when you it obviously term terminology that's usually used uh, not most of the time used in the vintage world people ask how is the loom and they're referring to the luminescence of the actual dial because those markers they get old they get to, to fade and so on and so forth Str the strong loom weak loom no loom i gotcha uh a skeleton a skeleton is just that and again watch also kind of like a a loose term because you'll have skeleton back Right, which is basically just an open back. Mm -hmm. Where if you're talking about a skeleton, it's usually a skeletonized watch from the front that you can literally see all the way through. Now patina. So we, I guess you know, people can understand what it is, just the aging of the watch. But maybe go, get, go into a little more into why it's a good thing. So here's the thing: when you comes, and this is when we're talking about vintage watches. Obviously, patina is in a way that a metal will discolor over time mm -hmm. if it sits for a long amount of time, right? Over age, right? Uh, patina, there's patina on a the dial, there's patina on the metal, there's mm -hmm. patina everywhere, right? With vintage watches, you can take two, basically same exact reference numbers, same exact watches, more or less in the same condition, but one will have a certain look versus another, which is where patina comes in, how it aged over time. And it, it's, it's the appealing side of things. And unfortunately, that's infinite. Right? Because what's appealing to one is not appealing to another. There is a general consensus of what an appealing vintage watch looks like based on the way the metal has patina based on the way the dial has patina over time. Mm -hmm. You get into tropical dials. That's you know a form of patina, if you will, right? Uh, and uh, again, patina is important, but it's not really a factor. Like there's no way to me in words to describe using the words patina on a vintage watch what it more, looks like. more than what a good picture will, which yeah. is why, you know, you can say nice, nice, nice patina dial, nice patina case, you know, very attractive, but that's just my opinion. I, then I'm going to say, send me the, like if I'm buying a brand new Rolex, I don't need detailed pictures. I know what yeah. it looks like. Tell me it's brand new and send me the watch. Yeah. If it's a vintage Rolex, now you're saying, okay, give me really nice close shots of the dial, of the loom, of the patina. Of course. The, the, there's a case. lot more. There's a lot more that goes into variability. It. But in reality, it's just of, it's a matter of opinion. Hey, this vintage watch, like I just really like the way this dial got all fucked up over time because it gave it this overall certain vintage look that I love. Yeah, now it's unique. It's exactly. It's really one of one. Um, a unicorn is different from a grail watch, I guess, how? 
a unicorn what's a unicorn you know when people refer to a unicorn in any lingo they usually say oh my god that that's a unicorn right there something that usually never happens or something that happens like once in a blue moon right so for somebody everybody's unicorns are different it's not the what was it the 69 shelby in the movie speed right what is like that's my unicorn no it has nothing yeah. to do with that it's really something that refers to oh my god this thing is literally impossible to find it's a unicorn so today we had an unboxing there was a unicorn in there that that's a skeletonized ap i've been in the business 20 years i knew of the watch i've never have held it in hands and odds are there's a lot of watches that i held in my hands but to me that's a unicorn something that i could never go and find ever again possibly gotcha and it doesn't have to be a grail watch no yeah. a lot of the unicorns are going to end up being grails for someone again yeah. remember grail is a very loose term yeah. for somebody a tutor is a grail so i recently had an episode with peter where we went over spotting fake rolexes and there was a couple terms in there that came from that you know we had frankenstein super frankenstein or super frank um, tell me what a Frankenstein watch is. So a Frankenstein watch is something that has all original parts, right? And it's just a watch that's put together. I got a case from this one Rolex. I got a dial from another Rolex. I got a bracelet from a third Rolex. I got Lincolns from another one. I put it all together. It's all genuine Rolex, but it's a Frankenstein. Or I take a, um, a non-Rolex example because we keep referring back to Rolex. A non-Rolex example, a perpetual calendar Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, right? Uh, it's a possibility to pull out the regular dial and put in a skeleton dial. Now, the difference between a regular dial and uh, a skeletonized perpetual calendar is about 100%, right? But you can still tell that that watch didn't belong there due to certain functionalities on the dial that don't match up with the original perpetual. Gotcha. That's a Frankenstein. So one of the things that we've seen a lot of, you know, recently with, you know, a lot of the bust downs was, you know, you take a 5711 and you, and people put this openly in their post, aftermarket bracelet, you know, original movement or Patek Philippe movement. If they say original movement, you assume it's still that 5711. Yeah, you movement. have to remember that whether it's a 5711 or any other watch out there, they have certain, uh, you know, calibers that go into a multitude of watches, yeah. same caliber, right? So, for example, for a bust down, uh, for like the worst bust down ever, I remember I was, I, we never got into that stuff because I always shied away from that stuff. The only time I've ever sold bust downs is either I sold them wholesale in bulk mm -hmm. because I knew where to get them and people wanted them. One time I remember I sold... I think the biggest deal is like 146 bust down day just, wow. right? I ordered them, I flipped them over, made my margin great. Uh, I've had clients that would request them. Mm -hmm. You never see them on our website, you never see them for sale, but you, people do request them. The worst bust down I've seen, I remember I was offered, I think it was out of Korea, where they were making these Nautiluses, mm -hmm. they were the chandeliers, the ones with baguettes, right? The like average wholesale cost on that was like $48,000, $50,000, and they sold for like 100, yeah. right? Um, guess what? Case is not real. Mm -hmm. Bracelet is not real. Doesn't mean it's not gold. It's gold, yeah. 100%. It's 18 karat gold. It's made one to one. It's a, and the reason they do that is not because they don't want to use the real case. It's because it's a lot easier to manufacture that bracelet already with the, the place to set the diamonds instead of sitting there and drilling the entire yeah. bracelet. Right? It's much, it's much easier. Right? And what do you know? You take a, I forget the caliber that works for them. Uh, it was a Calatrava six thousand G, I believe. All of a sudden, that watch that was trading at like eleven thousand dollars went through the roof, started trading at twenty-two because they were pulling out that movement and making that watch from scratch. Because again, Nautilus has had a good value, you know, at the time, not as crazy as they've gone up then, but they still had a high, much higher value than, let's say, that Calatrava. So why bother messing up a Nautilus? Plus, they started drying up when you can take the same exact caliber that goes into a 5711 and just make the watch from scratch. So the entire, I mean, the dial, the case, the band, the hands, the markers, everything was aftermarket except for a color drop. The, hand, the hands were original. So they kept those from the Nautilus? No, they kept it from the caliber. Oh, from, okay. Exactly. So from, from the color yeah. from, from the color travel, right? So it's, it's one, of, and a lot of times they did diamond hands anyway. So, yeah. uh, so it was, ba what, what you're basically paying for is a diamond watch that has a paddock movement in it. Now, the next step up was to take an actual watch, literally drill holes in it, yeah. and set, set it with diamonds, then you have the original watch with aftermarket diamonds. My worst experience was when I saw the 5720, 5746, I forget the the anniversary paddock, the Who one that, the one that went up to <laughs> like $600,000 and people put baguettes in it, and- Oh, the, the, just the bigger size, the, the, bigger, the 40th the, anniversary. The 40th yeah. anniversary, right? That's yeah. a watch that went up to like $800,000, yeah. and then people that got it busted down were offered like 250 for it while they That's paid like insane. 600 for it that would make more sense to do aftermarket everything uh, yeah absolutely yeah. keep the dial keep the original movement and just 
aftermarket bracelet. The problem is the people that got that done, they didn't really care. That's they wanted true. to look. You know what I mean? They didn't care if it was an yeah. anniversary or whatever. And odds are they didn't get to keep the original. Like if I wanted to do, uh, we were uh, in a car yesterday, a client called in, he was talking about, oh, he said, what are your thoughts on the RM1103 uh, diamonds? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not what Richard Miller is known for. An agent's thing was like, I'm not a big fan. He's like, but you ever, if you ever wanted to, you know, put diamonds on your watch, the only thing you need to do is take yeah. off the top case, keep the original case, have somebody manufacture the case, wear it like that for a little bit, and then take your watch back to this original estate. I see a lot of people creating sapphire cases for Richard Miller, RMs, yeah. which are, they're aftermarket, they are beautiful. Any idea why nobody has done it, or uh, not nobody, because I just saw somebody do it and I thought it was awesome for a Rolex. They yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's for Daytonas. Rolex is very tough to mess with. Is that what it is? Because yeah. Rolex will shut you down like you don't understand. I forget what that girl in California was that was taking old vintage Rolex and making mm -hmm. the colorful dials, and they shut it down like yeah. crazy. And then Rolex came out with their own OPs. <laughs> How surprising. original. How original and surprising yeah. that was, right? But uh, Rolex is just a very tough brand to mess with, and it's like this. You can sit there and just do a little customization like everybody else does on 47th mm -hmm. Street or anywhere else, but the minute you take it a little bit bigger and the minute you get a little bit of spotlight, that's when Rolex will come in yeah. and just eat you alive. Any other terms that you could think of off the top of your head that you hear on a regular basis that we might have not covered? I, I skipped some very simple ones, but there might be something more interesting. Or uh, Look, it's... Uh, Done deal is another thing you hear around the office a lot. A lot of the times, like, yeah. oh, I'm selling, I'm selling this guy a watch. I'm, I got this guy. He's buying this. He's buying. That. Is it a done deal? Because to me, and that's my personal favorite. When I actually, you know, when I talk to the sales team all day, every day, is it a done deal? A done deal to me. Money. People say done deal. You got the money in account. You ship it now. A done deal to me is that we got the money in account. The watch has already been shipped out. The client verbally has accepted said hey i love the watch everything is great seven days have gone by that's our return policy to me that's a done deal well a lot of the young salespeople say the minute somebody tells them i yeah. bought it and the problem is they get set themselves with disappointment so i always tell them hey yeah it's a done deal when yeah don't count your money until you have it in hand exactly all right well thank you very much for joining today and helping clarify some of these terms tttl T-T-T-L <laughs> <laughs> K-K um, If you like this episode If you like what we're doing here Make sure to let us know Comment, like, subscribe Write a review on the podcast If you're listening to this And we'll see you guys tomorrow Thanks, Hub Thank you